Hi everybody, I'm going to finish reading Charlotte's Web today. Chapter 21 is called The Last Day. Charlotte and Wilbur were alone. The families had gone to look for Fern. Templeton was asleep. Wilbur lay resting after the excitement and strain of the ceremony. His medal still hung around his neck. By looking out the corner of his eye, he could see it. Charlotte, he said after a while, why are you so quiet? She said, I like to sit still. I've always rather been quiet. Yes, but you seem especially so today. Do you feel all right? A little tired, perhaps, but I'm very peaceful. Your success in the ring this morning was, to a small degree, my success. Your future is assured. You will live secure and safe now, Wilbur. Nothing can harm you. These autumn days will shorten and grow cold. The leaves will shake loose from the trees and fall. Christmas will come, and then the snows of winter. You will live to enjoy the beauty of the frozen world. For you mean a great deal to Zuckerman, and he will not harm you, ever. Winter will pass, the days will lengthen, the ice will melt in the pasture pond. The song sparrow will return and sing, the frogs will awaken, the warm wind will blow again. All these sights and sounds and smells be will be yours to enjoy, Wilbur. This lovely world, those precious days, you will get to see them. And then Charlotte stopped. A moment later, a tear came to Wilbur's eye. Oh, Charlotte, to think that when I first met you, I thought you were cruel and bloodthirsty. And then he asked, why did you do all this for me? I don't deserve it. I've never done anything for you. Charlotte replied, you have been my friend. That in itself is a tremendous thing. I wove my webs for you because I liked you. After all, what's a life anyway? A spider's life can't help being something of a mess with all the trapping and eating of flies. But by helping you, perhaps I was trying to lift up my life too. Heaven knows anyone's life can stand a little bit of uplifting. Well, said Wilbur, I'm no good at making speeches. I haven't got your gift for words. But you have saved me, Charlotte. I would gladly give my life for you. I really, really would. I'm sure you would, she said. And I thank you for your generous sentiments. Charlotte, said Wilbur, we're all going home today. The fair is almost over. Won't it be wonderful to be back home in the barn again with the sheep and the geese? Aren't you anxious to get home? For a moment, Charlotte said nothing. Then she spoke in a voice so low that Wilbur could hardly hear her words. She said, I will not be going back to the barn. Wilbur leapt to his feet. Not going back, he cried. Charlotte, what are you talking about? She said, I'm done for, Wilbur. In a day or two, I'll be dead. I haven't even enough strength to climb down and into the crate. I doubt if I even have enough silk in my spinnerets to lower me to the ground. Hearing this, Wilbur threw himself down in agony of pain and sorrow. Great sobs racked his body. He heaved and he grunted, Charlotte, Charlotte, he moaned, Charlotte, my true friend. Now come now, let's not make a scene, she said. Be quiet, Wilbur. Please, be quiet. But I can't stand it, shouted Wilbur. I won't leave you here alone to die. If you're going to stay here, I shall stay too. Don't be ridiculous, 
said Charlotte. You can't stay here. Zuckerman, Lurvy, and John Arable, and the others will be back any minute now, and they'll shove you into the crate and away you'll go. Besides, it wouldn't make any sense for you to stay. There would be no one here to feed you. The fairgrounds will soon be empty and deserted. Wilbur was in a panic. He raced round and round the pen. Suddenly, he had an idea. He thought of the egg sack with 514 baby spiders in it and that they would be hatching in the spring. If Charlotte herself was unable to go back to the barn, at least he must take her children along. Wilbur rushed to the front of the pen. He put his front feet up on the top board and looked around. In the distance, he saw the Aravals and Zuckermans approaching. He knew he would have to act quickly. Where's Templeton? He demanded. He's in that corner under the straw fast asleep, said Charlotte. Wilbur rushed over, pushed his strong snout under the rat and tossed him up into the air. Templeton, screamed Wilbur, pay attention. The rat, surprised out of a sound sleep, looked first. He was dazed and disgusted. Oh, what kind of monkey shine is this? He said. Can a rat catch a wink asleep without being rudely popped up into the air? Listen to me, cried Wilbur. Charlotte is very ill. She has only a short time to live. She cannot cannot accompany us home because of her condition. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary that I take her egg sack with me. I can't reach it and I can't climb, and you're the only one that can get it. There's not a second to be lost. The people are coming. They'll be here in no time. Please, 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 Templeton, climb up there and get the egg sack. <sighs> the rat yawned and he played with his whiskers. Then he looked up at the egg sack. So, he said in disgust. So it's old Templeton to the rescue again, is it? Templeton do this, Templeton do that. Templeton, please run down to the dump and get me a magazine clipping. Templeton, please lend me a piece of string so I can spin a web. Oh, hurry, said Wilbur. <laughs> hurry up, Templeton. But the rat was in no hurry. So it's hurry up, Templeton, is it? Ha <laughs> ha, and what thanks do I ever get for my services? I would like to know. Never a kind word for old Templeton. Only abuse and wisecracks and side remarks. There's never a kind word about a rat. Templeton, said Wilbur in desperation. If you don't stop talking and get busy, all will be lost and I will die of a broken heart. Please climb up and get the egg sack. Templeton laid right back in the straw. Lazily, he placed his hands behind his head and crossed his knees. He mimicked, die of a broken heart. How touching, my, my. I notice that it's always me you come to when in trouble but I've never heard anyone's heart breaking on my account. Oh no, who cares anything about old Templeton? Get up, screamed Wilbur. Stop acting like a spoiled child. Templeton smiled and just laid still. Who made trip after trip to the dump? Why, it was old Templeton. Who saved Charlotte's life by scaring that arable boy away with a rotten goose egg? Bless my soul, I think it was old Templeton. Who bit your tail and got you back up on your feet this morning after you'd fainted in front of the crowd? Old Templeton. Has it ever occurred to you that I'm sick of running errands and doing favors? What do you think I am anyway? A rat of all work? Wilbur was desperate. The people were coming and the rat was failing him. Suddenly, he remembered Templeton's fondness for food. He said, Templeton, I will make you a solemn promise. You get Charlotte's egg sack for me. From now on, I will let you eat first when Lurvy brings my slops. 
I will let you have your choice of everything in the trough and I won't touch a thing until you're done eating. Oh, the rat sat up. You really mean that? I promise I cross my heart. All right, it's a deal, said the rat. He walked to the wall and started to climb. His stomach was still swollen from last night's gorge. Groaning and complaining, he pulled himself slowly to the ceiling. He crept along until he reached the egg sack. Charlotte moved aside for him. She was dying, but she still had enough strength to move a little. Then Templeton used his long, ugly teeth and began snipping the threads that were fastened to the sack to the ceiling. Wilbur watched from below. Use extreme care, he said. I don't want a single one of those eggs harmed. Templeton worked away at the job and managed to cut the sack adrift and carry it to the ground where he dropped it right in front of Wilbur. Oh, Wilbur heaved with a huge sigh of relief. Thank you, Templeton. I will never forget this as long as I live. Psh, neither will I, said the rat. I feel as though I've eaten a spool of thread. Well, home we go. Templeton crept into the crate and buried himself in the straw. He got out of sight just in time. Lurvy, John Arable, and Mr. Zuckerman came along at that moment, followed by Mrs. Arable, Mrs. Zuckerman, Avery, and Fern. Wilbur had already decided how he would carry the egg sack. There was only one way possible. He carefully took the little bum bundle in his mouth and he put it on the top of his tongue. He remembered what Charlotte had told him, that the sack was waterproof and very, very strong. It felt funny on his tongue. It made him drool a little bit. And of course he couldn't say anything. But as he was being shoved into the crate, he looked up at Charlotte and gave her a wink. She knew he was saying goodbye in the only way he could, and she knew her children were safe. Goodbye, whispered Charlotte. Then she summoned all of her strength and waved one of her front legs at him for the last time. She never moved again. The next day, as the Ferris wheel was being taken apart and the horse races were being loaded into vans and the entertainers were packing up their belongings and driving away in their trailers, Charlotte died. The fairgrounds were soon deserted. The sheds and buildings were empty. The infield was littered with bottles and trash. Nobody of the hundreds of people that had visited the fair knew that a gray spider had played the most important part of all. No one was with her when she died. Chapter 22 is called A Warm Wind. And so Wilbur came home to his beloved manure pile in the barn cellar. His was a strange homecoming. Around his neck he wore a medal of honor. In his mouth, he held a sack of spider's eggs. There is no place like home, Wilbur thought, as he placed Charlotte's 514 unborn children carefully in a safe corner. The barn smelled good. His friend, the sheep and the geese were glad to see him come back. The geese gave him a noisy welcome. Congratu, 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 congratulations, they cried. Nice work. Mr. Zuckerman took the medal from Wilbur's neck and hung it on a nail over the pig pen, and visitors could come and examine it. Wilbur himself could look at it whenever he wanted. In the days that followed, he was very happy. He grew to be a great size. He no longer worried about being killed, for he knew that Mr. Zuckerman would keep him for as long as he lived. Wilbur often thought of Charlotte. 
a few strands of her old web still hung in the doorway. Every day, Wilbur would stand and look up at the torn, empty web, and a lump would come into his throat. No one had ever such a friend, so affectionate, so loyal, and so skilled. The autumn days grew shorter. Lurvy brought the squashes and pumpkins in from the garden and piled them on the barn floor. The maples and birches turned bright colors and the wind shook them and they dropped their leaves one by one to the ground. Under the wild apple trees in the pasture, the red little apples lay thick on the ground and the sheep gnawed on them and the geese gnawed on them and the foxes would come at night and also eat them. One evening, just before Christmas, snow began falling. It covered the house and barn and field and woods. Wilbur had never seen snow before. When the morning came, he went out and he plowed in the drifts in the yard. Fern and Avery arrived, dragging a sled. They coasted down the lane and out onto the frozen pond way out into the pasture. Coasting is the most fun there is, said Avery. Fern said, the most fun there is, is when the Ferris wheel stops and Henry and I are at the top and Henry makes the car swing and we can see everything for miles and miles and miles. Goodness, are you still thinking about that old Ferris wheel? Said Avery. The fair was weeks and weeks and weeks ago. Fern said, I think about it all the time. After Christmas, the thermometer dropped to 10 below zero. Cold settled on the world. The pasture was bleak and frozen. The cows stayed in the barn all the time now. The sheep stayed near the barn too for protection. When they were thirsty, they ate snow. The geese hung around by the barnyard too. And Mr. Zuckerman fed them corn and turnips to keep them cheerful. Many, 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 many thanks, they would say. Templeton moved indoors when winter came too. His ratty home under the pig trough was too chilly. So he fixed himself a cozy nest in the barn behind the grain bins. He lined it with bits of dirty newspaper and rags. And whenever he found a trinket or a keepsake, he carried it home and he stored it there. He continued to visit Wilbur three times a day, of course, exactly at mealtime. Wilbur let him eat first. Then, when Templeton couldn't hold another mouthful, Wilbur would eat. As a result of overeating, Templeton grew bigger and fatter than any rat you had ever seen before. He was gigantic. He was as big as a young woodchuck. <laughs> the old sheep spoke to him about his size one day, and the old sheep said, You would live longer if you ate less. Eh, who wants to live forever, sneered the rat. I am naturally a heavy eater, and I get untold satisfaction from the pleasures of the feast. He patted his stomach, grinned at the sheep, and crept upstairs to lie down. All winter, Wilbur watched over Charlotte's egg sack as though he were guarding his own children. He had scooped out a special place in the manure pile for them. On very cold nights, he laid real close so that his breath would warm the egg sack. For Wilbur, nothing in life was so important as this small round object. Nothing else mattered. Patiently, he awaited the end of winter and the coming of the little spiders. Life is always a rich and steady time when you are waiting for something to happen or to hatch. The winter ended at last. I, I heard the frogs today, said the old sheep. Listen, you can hear them now. Wilbur stood still, and he could hear the voices of hundred little frogs. Springtime, said the old sheep. Another spring. As she walked away, Wilbur saw a new lamb following her. It was only a few hours old. The snow melted and ran away. Almost every morning there was another new lamb in the sheepfold. The goose was sitting on nine eggs. 
The sky seemed wider and a warm wind blew. The last remaining strands of Charlotte's old web floated away and vanished. One fine sunny morning after breakfast, Wilbur stood watching his precious egg sack. He wasn't thinking of anything much. As he stood there, he noticed something move. He stepped closer and stared. A tiny spider crawled from the sack. It was no bigger than a grain of sand, no bigger than the head of a pin. Its body was gray with a black stripe underneath. Its legs were gray and tan. It looked just like Charlotte. Wilbur trembled all over when he saw it. The little spider waved at him. Then Wilbur looked more closely. Two more little spiders crawled out and waved. They climbed around and around on the sack, exploring their new world. Then there were three more, then eight more, then ten more. Charlotte's children were here at last. Wilbur's heart pounded. He began to squeal. Then he raced in circles. Then he did a backflip. Then he planted his feet front and came to a stop right in front of Charlotte's children. Hello there, he said. The first spider said hello, but his voice was so small it was hard to hear. I am an old friend of your mother's, said Wilbur. I'm glad to see you. Are you all right? Is everything all right? The little spiders waved at him. Wilbur could see by the way they acted that they were glad to see him. Is there anything I can get you? Is there anything you need? The young spiders just waved. For several days and several nights they crawled here and there, up and down, around and about, waving at Wilbur, trailing their tiny little drag lines behind them and exploring their home. There were dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Wilbur couldn't count them, but he knew that he had a great many new friends. They grew quite rapidly. Soon each was as big as a BB. They made tiny webs near the sack. Then came a quiet morning when Mr. Zuckerman opened a door on the north side of the barn. A warm draft of rising air blew softly through the barn cellar. The air smelled of the damp earth and of the sweet springtime. The baby spiders felt the warm updraft. One spider climbed to the top of the fence. Then it did something that came as a great surprise to Wilbur. The spider stood on its head, pointed its spinnerets into the air, and let loose a cloud of fine silk. The silk formed a balloon. As Wilbur watched, the spider let go of the fence and rose off into the air. Goodbye, it said as it floated up and up. Wait a minute, screamed Wilbur. Where do you think you're going? But the spider was already out of sight. Then another baby spider crawled to the top of the fence, stood on its head, made a balloon, and sailed away. Then another spider, then another spider. The air was soon filled with tiny balloons. Each balloon was carrying a spider. Wilbur was frantic. Charlotte's babies were disappearing at a great race. Wilbur cried, come back children. Goodbye, they called, goodbye, goodbye. At last, one little spider took time enough to stop and talk to Wilbur before he made his balloon. We're leaving here on a warm updraft. This is our moment for setting forth. We are aeronauts, and we are going out into the world to make webs for ourselves. But where are you going? asked Wilbur. Wherever the wind takes us, High, low, near, far, east, west, north, south. We take to the breeze, we go as we please. Are all of you going? asked Wilbur. You can't all go. I would be left alone with no friends. 
Your mother wouldn't want that to happen, I'm sure. The air was now so full of balloonists that the barn cellar looked as though a mist had gathered. Balloons by the dozen were rising, circling, and drifting away from the door. Cries of goodbye, goodbye, goodbye came weakly to Wilbur's ears. He couldn't bear to watch any more. In sorrow, he sank to the ground and closed his eyes. This seemed like the end of the world, to be deserted by Charlotte's children. Wilbur cried himself to sleep. When he woke up, it was late afternoon. He looked at the egg sack, and it was empty. He looked into the air. All of the balloonists were gone. Then he walked drearily to the doorway where Charlotte's web used to be. He was standing there looking up and thinking of her when he heard a small voice. Salutations. I'm up here. So am I, said another voice. And so am I, said a third voice. Three of us are staying. We like this place and we like you. Wilbur looked up. At the top of the doorway, three small webs were being constructed. On each web, working busily, was one of Charlotte's daughters. Wilbur asked, Can I take this to mean that you have definitely decided to live here in the barn and I'm going to have three friends? You can indeed, said the spiders. What are your names, please? asked Wilbur. He was trembling with joy. I'll tell you my name, replied the first little spider. If you tell me, why are you trembling? Wilbur said, I'm trembling with joy. Then my name is Joy, said the first spider. The second spider asked, what was my mother's middle initial? A, said Wilbur. Then my name is Arania, said the spider. How about me, asked the third spider. Will you just pick me out a nice sensible name? Something not too long, not too fancy, and not too dumb. Wilbur thought long and hard. Nellie, he suggested. Fine, I like that very much said the third spider. You may call me Nellie. She daintily fastened her orb line to the next spoke of the web. Wilbur's heart brimmed with happiness. He felt that he should make a short speech on this very important occasion. Joy, Arania, Nellie, he began. Welcome to the barn cellar. You have chosen a beautiful doorway from which to string your webs. I think it is only fair to tell you that I was devoted to your mother. I owe my very life to her. She was brilliant, beautiful, and loyal to the very, very end. I shall always treasure her memory. To you, her daughters, I pledge my friendship forever and ever. I pledge mine, said Joy. I do too, said Arania. And so do I, said Nellie. It was a happy day for Wilbur, and many more happy, tranquil days followed. As time went on and the months and years came and went, he was never without friends. Fern did not come regularly to the barn anymore. She was growing up and was careful to avoid childish things. But Charlotte's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren year after year lived in the doorway. Each spring, there were new little spiders hatching out to take the place of the old. Most of them sailed away on their balloons, but always two or three stayed and they set up housekeeping in the doorway. Mr. Zuckerman took fine care of Wilbur all the rest of his days, and the pig was often visited by friends and admirers, for nobody ever forgot the year of the triumph and the miracle of the web. Life in the barn was very good, night and day, winter and summer, 
spring and fall, dull days, and happy days. It was the best place to be, thought Wilbur, with warm, delicious food, with the geese, the changing seasons, the heat of the sun, the passage of the swallows, the nearness of rats, the sameness of sheep, the love of spiders, the smell of manure, and the glory of everything. Wilbur never forgot Charlotte. Although he loved her children and grandchildren dearly, none of the new spiders ever quite took her place in his heart. She was in a class by herself. It is not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. Charlotte was both. The End